Welcome to our virtual video Buddhism 123. Presently we're in a health, economic, and social crisis. Normal life is not normal anymore. People are not in the streets, and things we are used to is really at a standstill. There's no shopping, school, and our social actions are really limited. So, in a sense, we're back to the basics. So let's ask, how can Buddhism help us at this time? This is an opportune time to really learn about the basics of Buddhism and how, by taking a modern perspective, can the teachings apply to our current situation. We'll start with uh, a question that we sometimes hear about Buddhism from new people. Is it a religion, a philosophy, or a way of life? I think, yes, it's all three. And we often don't hear these questions asked of other religions. But let's go through this. Religion. Yes, it's a, it's a process working toward truth. Betterment of our lives and the betterment of society. It has the ideas of morality, relationships, spirituality, and life and death issues. It may not conform to what many Americans are used to in the Abrahamic religions in that uh, there's not an emphasis on the God or an emphasis on the afterlife and um, uh, not an emphasis on the judgment of good and bad. Now, in terms of philosophy, yes, its tenets are, have a deep philosophy and thoughts uh, which has been uh, thought through through centuries of masters who have elaborated on past masters and have gone through all kinds of deep uh, spiritual thought. The Buddha himself said that uh, we shouldn't take his teachings just by belief alone, but we must test it out ourselves. And so it is a deep philosophy that has uh, a broad implications and deep, uh, uh, deep thoughts. And like science, it relies on evidence and experience to validate its teachings. Uh, and is it a way of life? Yes, uh, this category seems to say that a culture just does things without possibly a central issue of religion that uh, is, uh, is inspiring it. Yes, it's a way of life. I think uh, especially Shin Buddhism, uh, prominent in Japan, uh, the religion has inspired a culture that reflects its tenets. And we'll get into that next week. So these labels of uh, whether it's a religion, philosophy, or where of life are just labels in that it does encompass all three. Buddhism began with a human named Siddhartha Gautama, who was a prince in India 2,600 years ago. Uh, it's important that he was a human. Uh, he was concerned with many of the things we're concerned with, old age, sickness, and death. And so he left his life of luxury as a prince and followed uh, monks at uh, his time, uh, some ascetics, and practiced these uh, practices and mastered them for over six years. But he found that he was no closer to truth. So he left them, sat under a tree, and vowed not to arise until he discovered what was true. We say that he was enlightened. Uh, after his enlightenment, a passerby saw his aura and asked him, Sir, are you a god? And he replied, No, I am awake. And that statement means that, as humans, we all have the potential of awakening. And so, Buddhism is a process toward awakening to true reality. And what the Buddha realized that is that, as most of us humans, we only have a portion of that true reality because our reality is made up possibly only because of our limited minds. So what is true? The Buddha, the, the Buddha looked around and decided what was true in the natural universal world. What he saw was that everything changed, something called, he called impermanence, anicca. That nothing stayed the same, everything was in a dy dynamic movement of change. A second thing that it was universal is that everything is interconnected, a notman. Nothing is separate. Nothing has an entity that lasts in its form for uh, a long, long time. 
And so uh, these two things are natural, and he realized that uh, on our journey toward truth, that as humans we might uh, adhere to these two principles, that everything changes and that we are all interconnected. This impermanence is uh, something that uh, I didn't realize uh, in its full extent until I was in, in college. At Berkeley I took a, a course in uh, geography, I think because I heard that it was an easy class and I probably needed to uh, increase my uh, grade point. In any event, one of the things I learned was that the Mississippi Valley was created by the Mississippi River. Uh, I think we all can understand that now, but you know, as a 20-year-old, this was an eye-opener for me. That how does one river create a whole valley? Well, it takes millions of years. Uh, where we live now in Chula Vista, there's a, a grammar school uh, up the hill, and in front of that school there are these huge boulders, and encrusted in them are seashells. Now this school is about 400 feet above sea level. So how did these boulders get up there? The reason? It's taken millions of years, but this area was covered by the ocean. And so this is a, a sense of time, that everything changes. And that in the past, I had thought the rivers were uh, contained. I was used to the Sacramento River, which has man-made levees that contain it. But in reality, rivers create valleys, and uh, mountains, uh, whether it's now mountains or now uh, uh, were millions of years ago under the sea. So things change, and in Buddhist thought, there's thought in terms of eons, something called kalpas, an undescribable length of time. So things do change. The other thing is interdependence, nothing is separate. Now, this is uh, uh, borne out truth uh, by our knowledge of atoms and molecules, that we know that oxygen becomes carbon dioxide as we breathe it out, and trees convert that back to oxygen. We know that uh, we are made up of animals and plant life that we have ingested. Everything is contained. And so uh, this thought of no self is not that we don't exist, but it's our erroneous thinking that we're separate and we e exist independently of others. We are interdependent and that uh, this uh, thought of interdependence is something we would gain uh, in life if we lived according to these truths. Now, this thought of interdependence and impermanence is true for all things on earth. And uh, it is that uh, our insight into this is uh, what affects us as humans. However, as humans we have something called ego. And we look at things from our point of view of me. That true reality is, comes from the point of the universe. And so what the Buddha is saying is that when I see life from my own point of view, I have a dualistic point of view. I see things as one or the other. That an up has to have a down as reference. Inside needs an outside, me and others, life and death. And that as humans, we can't get away from this dualistic thought. And that uh, to know that this is true, you might ask yourself as I, as I speak, is what he's saying good or bad? Most everything we do comes from this point of view from the self. True reality comes from that other place. And so in order to uh, resolve this, the Buddha talked about the middle path, a balance. That it is not to be good over bad, but it is to look at life as a balance. And this process of life goes through uh, you know, this sense of balance. Rather than achieving a place because of impermanence, we can't stay at that place. We're always in a dynamic way. This is why in a sense, Buddhists are uh, ecologists, and we have an equal sangha where we're always aware of our impact on the earth and the earth's impact on us. Now, I think what's familiar are the Four Noble Truths, and the first truth is that there is dis-ease, or suffering, or some, something that uh, alerts us that things are unbalanced. The second point, he said, is that this unease or dis-ease is caused by our uh, 
ego point of view. And it's our sense of uh, uh, ignorance, it's our greed, it's our hatred uh, that causes us to be separate. That we think that we are not like that other person. And that third noble truth is that there is bliss. And that uh, there is this place where things can be resolved. But I think we may have an uh, unrealistic uh, thought in bliss. It's not a place where we stay and that things never change. That my uh, thought of bliss is that it is the counter to this ease, that it is this place of balance. The fourth noble truth is the path, and it is the eightfold path uh, which, in which we gain a wholesome perspective that everything is a process. So 2,600 years ago in India, people who followed the Buddha uh, left their conventional life. If they wanted to be uh, with this universal truth, they became monks and nuns. They gave up um, all possessions, had only a robe. They ate what was uh, given to them as they begged. And uh, what they did all day was study and uh, meditate and think of spiritual things. So in a way, they were not encumbered by the things we are in everyday life, making a living and so forth. And so all their thoughts were on the spiritual uh, aspects. But today in America, we're working. We have to maintain uh, a work life, uh, families, uh, contribute to our society. And yet, uh, we're looking for the spiritual answer. We have Buddhist practices, and many Americans have found great uh, uh, benefit from the practices of mindfulness and meditation. And Yet we're encumbered by this uh, practice uh, of earning a living. So how do we look at this? Uh, it's been said that there are two levels. We can look at the horizontal level, which is the practical, that there are things that help us uh, in Buddhist practice. But there's also this vertical level, the spiritual aspect. And sometimes these uh, aspects are neglected in the general public when they talk about Buddhism. Uh, we'll talk about this uh, much more next week when uh, we talk about Shin Buddhism. And so, uh, the reason I bring these two aspects up is because we sometimes confuse uh, the fact that there is this practical aspect of Buddhism and the spiritual aspect of Buddhism, and sometimes the confusion of those two aspects confuses our thought of what Buddhism might be. So just to review. Buddhism is a path of awakening, and it's going with the natural principles of interdependence and impermanence. And it's our minds that determine our reality, but we're only seeing a portion of true reality. So Buddhism is a practice of developing our minds to experience and accept multiple views, always to get broader and deeper. Our practice of is of being centered, not about just being good or bad. And so we treat all aspects of life as part of me, and that means we live life with kindness, compassion, respect. It's the me within the we. Equanimity, peacefulness, and gratitude, and joy are the results. So how might Buddhism help us now in this pandemic? In this pandemic, tells us that death has always been a threat to us. I think it's because of the last half of the 20th century when life has been very good uh, with our modern technology and advances in science. We've been able to uh, make death uh, kind of in the background, that we have these thoughts of insurance and guarantees that uh, this is not the threat that it has been for human life uh, for uh, the entirety of human life, and it's still true in many third world countries. And so, uh, here, we can ask the question in this pandemic, what is enough? You know, what is our real problem? And how might we work through this? It is that it's important how we think, and that these uh, threats of illness, old age, and death has us determine what is important, that we might sit in 
in silence and think about what is enough, you know, what is my life really about? And I think the answers that come out is that it's about relationships, not about how much we have or what social standing we have, but how do we relate to others? And so uh, this pandemic brings us back to the basics and Buddhism alerts us to what is real and what is meaningful to us. And it's nice to know that in our Sangha, our members have been reaching out to others, especially the elders, and helping them and helping those who might live alone or who don't have computers to get the information that's important to know about uh, what is safe. And also uh, to connect with them so that they know that in our uh, physical isolation and separateness, we still have a connection and many members have been contacting others uh, through the telephone. And in this way, uh, they get this information of safety, uh, things that they should be doing, and also have a connection if they need assistance. So again, to conclude, uh, we see many stories that, uh, uh, of this connection. On TV, we see many stories of heroes, of people uh, realizing that their lives are connected to others. And, uh, going into danger, uh, dangerous situations like many in the medical field. And so we've always had this problem of death and disease. Uh, this pandemic brings it to real life, not only in our community, but throughout the world. And so Buddhism is waking up to this and not just sitting with it, but knowing that we have a dynamic uh, impact on how the future is uh, to be determined and that it's up to us uh, with our little minds to think in multiple ways that we are involved with all people and that our future is determined by our thoughts and our actions. It's aligning our minds with true reality, what we call Amida Buddha. And so when we say the Nembutu, Namo Amida Buddha, it's our affirmation of our uh, association and our oneness with true reality. So in the next session, we'll be talking about Jodo Shinshu, that branch of Buddhism that's for the uh, average, ordinary person, and how we live this life uh, of uh, Nembutu in our practical, ordinary life, and also uh, reach that spiritual level. So with that, uh, we'll close again with our affirmation of the Nembutu. Namo Amidabhats. Namo Amidabhats, Namandav.